Good evening everyone and Good welcome evening. to this evening's uh, programme. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Sister Kezia, are you able to pray for us please? Yes, sure. Thank you. Let us pray. Let us kneel down and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for being with us this whole day and now giving us this opportunity to come and hear a word from you. Lord, we have the assurance from your word which says that those who come to you, you by no means cast them out. Therefore, Lord, here we are, weary and tired from the toils of the week. And Lord, we are coming to your feet and to lay everything, whatever is in our hearts, whatever is in our mind, just to lay it at the cross and to just adore you. Lord, I pray that you will give us the Sabbath rest which you intend to give your people, Lord, who believe and trust in you. Therefore, this evening, Lord, as we sit, I pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us, within us as well, Lord, so that we'll be able to comprehend the message which is coming from you. We also pray for the one who is going to break the bread of, of life, Lord. I pray that you fill him with the Holy Spirit as well, Lord. Let him not speak his own, own word, but the words which come from you, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, that when we ask these things, Lord, you hear us and you answer our prayers. Therefore, Lord, at this time, we just want to say thank you for everything. I pray all these things in the loving name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer. We'll sing the theme song, Praise of Our Father.
we'd like to welcome again Elder Zong. He's one, one of the founders of this ministry. ministry. Um, God has blessed. He's certainly blessed for it. So welcome Elder Zong. We've been blessed with the messages all week. This is the last one in this series. series but I'm sure there's going to be another one. I'm sure there'll be <laughs> another one. The time is yours Elder Zong. Thank you, thank you very much, my sisters, for, for the leading. And may God continue to bless you and your ministry. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is to quickly share my slides with everyone uh, so that we are all on the same page. And uh, please remember to pray for <clears throat> for these gadgets. These gadgets at times they, they play up. So let's pray that uh, we will have an uninterrupted uh, presentation this evening. Um, <clears throat> um, I want to thank God once again for this ministry and uh, for bringing us together every night to hear his word. It is my prayer that uh, uh, we all take very seriously every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Uh, tonight, um, <clears throat> Is our last night for this week, as uh, my sisters just said. I hope and pray that uh, it's gonna, not going to be the last. I look forward to another presentation, uh, opportunity to present another series to you very soon. And um, anytime you need me, I'm there. And may God continue to bless you. Today, friends, let's go back. Um, thematic uh, text, which is Jude 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We, this evening, going to look at um, the children of Israel just before they entered Canaan. Moses records an incident at Shittim, which is very, very important for us in these last days. If the remnant are to make it, we are told we have to draw lessons from what happened to the children of Israel in the past. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 1 all the way to about verse 12, or verse 11, Paul there says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning how the Lord took our fathers from Egypt to Canaan and how he guided them in the wilderness. When you come down, I think it must be verse 5, 4 or 5, he says, but the Lord was not happy with some of them. They were overthrown in the wilderness. They couldn't make it to Canaan. Those who contended for the faith was delivered to the saints, they made it. And we are told only two. Who are these? Caleb and Joshua. And the Bible says, because in them was another spirit, was found a completely different spirit, another spirit that is a spirit different from the spirit of those who perished in the wilderness. If you and I are to make it to the heavenly Canaan, we need to have the spirit that was in Caleb and Joshua. 
children of Israel had seen the blessings of the Lord by day and by night. They had seen miracles. Water gushing from the rock, feeding men and animals. A cloud by day in the desert, hot desert. The people of fire in the night. The children of Israel knew no darkness, brothers and sisters. Because he who was amongst them and leading them was the light of the world. But when they got to shit him, brothers and sisters, it's sad. In fact, I want us to look at chapter 9 to 20. I think it's good for us to start from chapter 23. Chapter 23 you find there the king of the Midianites. He's scared of the children of Israel. He's heard of their story, how they were conquering and to conquer. Even Pharaoh, the superpower of the time, Thought to be invincible, drowned in Red Sea. Nation after nation fell before the children of Israel. And so the king of the Moabites, the so Midianites, was scared to death. He says, what can I do to stop these people? For I'm afraid as they try seek to pass, get into Canaan, they will pass by and destroy my nation. He sought the help of Pastor Bella. Spirit of prophecy in Prophets and Kings says Pastor Bella was a person who was well known to the children of Israel. He was a renowned man of God. Pastor Bella. And uh, we are told for the love of money, he was enticed to curse the children of Israel. As he attempted, first time he failed, second time he failed, third time he says, the Bible says in Numbers 23 verse 18 and 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it? Good. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. Friends, the Bible is very clear. The reason why no weapon formed against Israel could prevail against them is because, according to Pastor Balaam, he, meaning God, hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Did you hear that? Neither hath his business. Brothers and sisters, 
The Bible is very clear. There was no iniquity in Israel, and as a result, no nation could conquer. No nation could fight and win against Israel. They seemed invincible. And they were, as long as they were in good and regular standing with God. Imagine what this church could be like with the zeal of its founders. That group of young people, the youth, who met every time to study the Bible together, pray together, fast together for revelation. Imagine if this church was in that standing with God at the moment. How much of godly exploits would we have, would we have achieved this far? We could have done great things for God. God would have used us mightily. Who would have probably finished the work and by now we could be home. But the problem that was with Israel is the same problem that the church has today. When the children of Israel got to Shittim, we read from the book of Numbers, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit war with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did it and bowed down to their gods. Ooh. They bowed down to their gods? Yes, to the god of who? To the gods of who? The gods of the Moabite. And Israel joined himself unto Baalpah. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay everyone, slay everyone, his men that were joined unto Baal And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought into his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, when we come to verse 14, now, the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish women, was Zimri, the son of Salo, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianitish women that was slain was Cosby. Who was Cosby? She was the daughter of Zer. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. Hear what Ellen White says, writing under inspiration. These are not your words, brothers and sisters. This is inspiration. These are the words of the Holy Ghost. Listen to what she says. Patriots and Prophets, page 455, paragraph 2. Zimri, one of the nobles of Israel, came boldly into the camp accompanied by a Midianitish who hallowed. This is an elder, brothers and sisters. Bringing a halot into the camp of Israel. You know what a halot is? It's a woman who 
spray the skirt, skirt all over, anyway, with anybody. She says here, a princess of a chief house in Midian, whom he escorted to his tent. Now, listen to the following words. Never was vice bolder or more stubborn. Inflamed with wine. Mark, mark that word, wine. Inflamed with wine. The wine of Babylon. Inflamed with wine. Zimri declared his sin as Sodom. And glorified his shame. I want you to understand the situation. The circumstances under which all this happened. Listen to what Sister Ellen White says. The priests of Israel and the leaders, these are of Israel, yeah? Had prostrated themselves in grief and humiliation, weeping between the porch and the altar. What were they doing? Entreating the Lord to spare his people and give not his heritage to reproach. When this prince in Israel flouted his sin in the sight of the congregation as if to defy the vigilance of God and mock the judges of the nation. Friends, this is serious. This is taking place in the church of God. We are told in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that these things were written to us who live in the days of the end, in the last days. Why? They were given to us as examples. Examples. So clearly from this history, there is an example of falling away. Example of falling away. Falling away of who? The leadership in the church. Zimri was an elder. He was a head. A commander within the Simeonites. He was not an ordinary man. Not at all. Way up there in the ranks of the church. Division level, if you like. Friends, how come people who had seen so great a salvation behave in this fashion? Listen to what Ellen White says in Patriots and Prophets, page 459, paragraph 1. Danger, there is danger. In living in life of ease and self in that insecurity that they were led into sin. They failed to keep God ever before them. How did they fail to keep God ever before them? She says, they neglected prayer. Did you hear that? And cherished a spirit of self-confidence. Oh, we are only just a few miles away from Canaan. We cannot forget about the toils of the desert. We can as well begin to enjoy ourselves. This fellow thought he could make a carnival of life. He will enjoy himself. Cast away his restraint. For the laws of God are a burden. They are burdensome. I wish I could do away with them and live my life to the fullest without any restraints. Without. Limits.
She says, easy in self-indulgence. What happened? Left the citadel of the soul unguarded. Good living. They went partying and enjoying themselves with the children of, of the Midianites and the Moabites. Having a big party in honor of the gods, not of Israel, but the gods of the Midianites. Israel joined himself to bow poor. Friends, it feels like that these days, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like when Moses was writing all these things, he wrote looking at our looking at us and the, uh, looking at the church of Laodicea, Israel, and then Penny. Laodicea, Israel, Pen. Laodicea, Israel, Pen. Ease and self-indulgence left the mind. That's the side of the soul. The mind. And got it? Neglected prayer. Neglected reading of the Bible. He is an elder who, if he was reading his Bible every day, would have known. Remember what Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 7 say? Concerning how the leaders how the leaders, the heads of the family, ought to teach the children the law of God every day. They left the side door of the soul unguarded. And debasing thoughts found entrance. Brothers and sisters, we need to choose wisely whatever we do. We need to choose our company carefully. Who do we associate with? Listen to what Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 says. Oh, you know it. Finish it for me. You know it. Yes. Blessed are they who do not walk in the company of the wicked. There is danger associating ourselves with those who are not in the same faith with us. We are told, brothers and sisters, that it was the traitors within the walls that overthrew the strongholds of principle and betrayed Israel into the power of Satan. What? It was the traitors within the walls that overthrew the strongholds of principle and betrayed Israel into the power of Satan. And she goes on to say, it is thus that Satan still seeks to compass the ruin of the soul. When today, the way he overthrew Israel in the wilderness, 24,000 of them on that day, is exactly the same ploy, the same strategy he's deploying against the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. Against God's people. How? Traitors from within. Did you hear that? Ellen White says we have more to fear from, from eh? we have more to fear from inside than from outside. We have more to fear from inside the church than from outside the church. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, the children of Israel had listened to Pastor Balaam. Pastor Balaam had invited, invited them to come into the camp of the Midianites and the Moabites and have a carnival in honor of their gods. The traitors from within. From within what? From within the faith. The 
faith of Pastor Balaam was the faith of Israel. That was the faith of Jacob. And so Jacob had a reason to trust in Pastor Balaam. Come with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Let's go off to 15. I'll read in your hearing. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, said he, which had the sharp sword with two edges. I know their works. And where thou dwellest, even where certain cities, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas, was my faithful matter, who was slain among you, we sit and dwells. God is a people, brothers and sisters, everywhere in this world. Even in Babylon, he has got his church there. He has people who are willing to be martyred for their faith. And here, Brother Antipas was there in Pergamos. We sit and sit, dwelleth. Jesus goes on to say, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Pastor Balaam? Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel? To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. All this was under the enticement, the allurement of Pastor Balaam. Elder Zimri went into this because of Pastor Balaam. Are you following my drift, brothers and sisters? Pastor Balaam influences Elder Zimri. Elder Zimri acts according to of their gods, tens, which the Pray. Our dear Father who art in heaven, we are at war with the enemy. You kicked him out of heaven. You defeated him, defeated him at Calvary. And we pray that you defeat him in this presentation. To your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate, Jesus says. Why does Jesus hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Why does God hate the doctrine of Balaam? Why does he hate that doctrine? And what is it? Compromise. Compromise. Nicolaitan teaching was similar in principle to the teaching of Pastor Balaam. Compromise. The Nicolaitans believed in what we call scholasticism, the mixture of the theology of God, the scriptures, and what else? And the philosophy of Aristotle and them guys in, Greek, in Greece. And so we have even in our universities today, and commingling of worldly philosophy, the teachings of the scriptures, 
Scholasticism, brothers and sisters. Jesus says, I hate this. Pastor Bellam compromises. How does he compromise? He mixes truth and error. He mixes the things of the world and the things of God. He does not make a distinction between the holy and the profane. Friends, and so Pastor Balaam doesn't see anything wrong in joining hands with the ecumenical body. And why it says in Patterns and Prophets, page 458, paragraph one, it was by associating with idolaters and joining in the festivities, the Hebrews were led to transgress God's law and bring his judgments upon the nation. Now, she doesn't end there. She comes, she applies it to our time. So now it is by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly and unite in their amusements that Satan is most successful in alluring them into sin. What does he do? Draws Adventists into the world. Friends, not everything that glitters is gold. Oh, look, the other Christians are doing it. They can't be wrong. After all, they are Christians. The only difference between them and us is that we go to church on Saturday, they go to church on Sunday. But they are good Christians. Look at their outward department. Look at their charities, look at their schools, look at their various institutions. They are doing good, aren't they? Let's join with them in an ecumenical movement. Oh, well, well as a matter of fact, we, we, we're not gonna compromise on our doctrines. So we will join them only in as far as it gives us good, it, 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 do, it does us good. Yes, Ellen White says that. If only we could join them only in as far as that joining would give us occasion to minister to them. The better, that would have been fine. God would not be moved by that. But listen, friends, we are joining them, setting our side, our distinctive doctrines and beliefs and embracing the why of Babylon. I want you to understand how Pastor Balaam accomplished this crafty design, this crafty scheme. Come with me to the book of Genesis chapter 19, verse 36 and 38, and see how crafty Pastor Balaam was. Thus were both the daughters of After they escaped the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah, what did they do? with child by their father. Cause their father to drink intoxicating wine, slept with their father. Verse 37 says, and the firstborn bear a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moab. And to this day, do you know who Lot is? Lot was a relative of Abraham, very close relative, the son of Abraham's brother. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Benami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. And when you go, the book of uh, Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25. There we are told that when Sarah passed away, Moses decided to marry, to remarry. The Bible says in verse one, then again Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, Zimran. And Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak 
and Shashua. Who is Midian? He's the father of the Midianites. Friends, the Moabites and the Midianites were cousins. There was a common denominator. In all of them ran the blood of Terah, the son of the, the, the father of Abraham. They were relatives by birth, biological relatives. <laughs> Can you see how Pastor Balaam was crafty? Can you see his craft? He goes to the children of Israel and says, you come join them in this party. They're having a festival, of, uh, you know, but look, we, we know you don't drink, but listen, listen, you, you, listen, these are your cousins. Come join them, brother. Come and sit at the World Council of Churches Ain't you a Christian? Don't you worship? The, don't we worship the same God? You read the same Bible as we do. But the only difference is that you go to church on Saturday and we go to church on Sunday. But listen, God knows we are all one people, we're one family. Come, we are cousins. Come, come, join us in the ecumenical movement. And so, we got a seat. We are members of the churches together in England. We got a seat the World Council of Churches, in alliance with evangelicals, their associations, and many other places. And our director of re religious liberty is a champion of that. Pastor Balaam. Hear what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 17. God requires his people. Now, as great a distinction from the world in customs, in habits and principles as he required of Israel anciently in the past. If they faithfully follow the teachings of his word, this distinction will exist. It, cannot be otherwise. Did you hear that? It cannot be otherwise, brothers and sisters. If we follow this injunction faithfully, if we follow this admonition faithfully, if we follow this teaching faithfully, there will be no commonality between the Seventh-day Adventists, the remnant people of God, and them churches. Those are God's people in there. They are deluded and deceived on one point and another. And God has commissioned you and I to call them out of Babylon, not to be to join them in Babylon. But Laodicea has got a problem to the angel of the church of Laodicea, of the Laodiceans, write these things. The church of the Laodiceans. Not the church in Laodicea. Are you with me, friends? His church be in Laodicea. He does not want his church to be of the Laodiceans. There must be a distinction. We must contend for the faith was delivered to the saints. We cannot be like them. Stand ye separate, God says. Warnings given to the Hebrews against assimilating with the hidden were not more direct or explicit than are those forbidding Christians to conform to the spirit and customs of the ungodly. Christ speaks to us. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. First John chapter 2, verse 15. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, what is he doing? He's severing his relationship with God. James says, is the enemy of God. He's severing his relationship with God. Friends, on this subject, there is no Switzerland. There's no neutral ground. 
Jesus says, <laughs> it's either we are with me or you scatter abroad. And Ellen White says in Patras and Prophets, page 458, paragraph one, the followers of Christ are to separate themselves from sinners, choosing their society only when there is opportunity to do them good. What is that? To bring them the message of salvation to them, to bring them the three angels' message, not to join them in power poor. How can the world tell the distinct the difference between fallen Protestantism and true Protestantism? Some of us, are, we don't love this distinction. We don't like this identity. We are only convicted on the Sabbath doctrine, but the rest we don't like. Even the exclusivity and peculiarity that comes with it, we shrink from it. And so when we are asked, which church do you go to? Well, uh, yeah, I, 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 we, 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 we go to church, I'm a Christian. I don't want to be clear that you're Seventh-day Adventist. And then White goes on to say, we cannot be too decided in shunning the company of those who exert an influence to draw us away from God. We cannot be too decided on this subject. It's done already. Ours is simply to cut off from the world, cut off, that's it. The matter is long decided. The day when you, when, when you raised your hand, accepting those vows, the matter was settled. And that's it. While we pray, while we pray, lead us not into temptation. We are to shun temptation so far as possible. Friends, prayer and fasting are indispensable facilities provided to us by a loving God. In the book, Councils on Diet and Foods, Ellen White says, if the savior of men with his divine strength felt the need of prayer, by the way, he was always in prayer, you know? Either he's praying, he's teaching, yeah? Ever praying. That's why he says in Luke chapter 18, men ought to pray always. Men ought not to faint. They ought to pray always. First Thessalonians chapter, chapter five, verse 17, pray without season. And here I like what Elder, Elder, Elder Randy's kid said the other day. It's not prophetic. Neither is it symbolic. It is literal, he says. If the savior of mankind with his divine strength felt the necessity or the need for prayer, how much more you and I, brothers and sisters, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals feel the necessity of prayer? Feel and constant prayer. When Christ was the most fiercely beset by temptation, he ate nothing. Oh, how we need to fast. Yeah, I need to pray a lot and ask the Lord to put me back into my mode of fasting. I used to fast a lot. And I'm praying, Father, please grant me that grace once more that I can be a man, I may be a man of fasting. And what goes on to say, Jesus Christ committed himself to God and through earnest prayer and perfect submission to the will of his father, came of conqueror. Do you want to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints? You need to fast and pray. Those who profess the truth of these last days above every other class of professed Christians should imitate the great exemplar in what? In prayer. 
You know, one of the lessons we learned from this story, brothers and sisters, is that the devil is a patient for. He lays his snares. And he patiently waits for the prey to kick on that snare. And once they are trapped in, logged in, he knows they can come out of it. And so Ellen White comments, she says, a long preparatory process unknown to the world goes on in the heart before the Christian commits open sin. It didn't just start, listen, it did not start at shooting. The backsliding in Elder Zimri's heart had taken place ages before. The circumstances were not ripe. As soon as the circumstances are ripe, the true rebellion manifests. That which is hidden in the heart comes to the fore. And so Ellen White says, the mind does not come down at once from purity and holiness to depravity, corruption, and crime. Why? She gives us the answer. She says, because it takes time to degrade those formed in the image of God to the brutal or the satanic. It's not easy. And so the devil is patient. He's waiting for a moment when to strike. Watching intently on your behavior, your passions, where the heart is inclined to. And he provides everything that can facilitate the decline of the soul, the declension of the soul. So if you see, you love football a lot. And each time Manchester is playing, you, you peep in and, oh, well, but whether I'm a seven dad, but no, I shouldn't be watching these things. And he said, he keeps supplying those things. So you switch off your, 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 your television, you go to your phone, Again, what pops out in that advertisement on the match. He relentlessly presents these allurements until you fall. The next thing you buy a ticket, you buy yourself a seat. It's a gradual process, brothers and sisters. It doesn't happen once. One other lesson we learned from here is that by beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed, brother, brothers and sisters. By the indulgence of impure thoughts, man can so educate his mind that sin, which he once loathed, will become pleasant to him. Can you imagine the children of Israel, an elder, intoxicated by wine? Those who were to be judges in Israel, those who were to be elders in Israel, followed the counsel which you find in the book of Proverbs. They did not take wine. How did it come that brother Zimri got this wine of Babylon? By beholding, we become changed. By the indulgence of impure thoughts, man can so educate his mind. That sin which he once loved, he once hated it, will become pleasant to him. The things that used to be abhorrent, the things that used to shun, the things that used to run away, all of a sudden, they become very attractive. It's dangerous to tarry or dally with sin. Ellen White uses the word flitting. Stop flitting with sin. It has this chameleon character in it. Changes its colors. The more you gaze, the more it changes. Ask your grandmother, Sister Eve, she will tell you, she gazed and, the, and that fruit, you know, was like, you know, something she had never seen in her lifetime by beholding. And guess what? At the right time, the devil came in and presented this proposition of rebellion. But thank God for Phineas. When you read that chapter, chapter 25, verse seven says, and when Phineas, Fine has fine. Am I pronouncing it well? You know, my English is not very good. I'm trying. Fine has, or Phineas, as we call them in our country, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest. Who was this? 
He was the son of a priest. Mm. Of Aaron, of the house of Aaron. This was a grandson of Aaron. What happened? He saw it. What did he see? He saw Zimri with Cosby going into the tent of Zimri to commit wardrobe and fornication. Guess what? He rose up from among the congregation. He rose up. Do you know what rising means? They were lying prostrate. The leaders and the elders weeping between the porch and the altar. He rose up from the altar. What did he do? And he went after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both men, them both, uh, 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 both of them through the men of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plagues or the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague, how many? 20 and 4,000. Yesterday I read you this passage of scripture of, uh, from the spirit of prophecy from the book of Evangelism, page 297, paragraph four. I think it's a befitting commentary. Listen to what LMI says. We are living in a perilous time and we need that grace that will make us valiant in fight, turning to fly the armies of the aliens. We are at that time, Ellen White says it's perilous time. Where does he get that from? From the book of, Tim, of, 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 of Timothy, written by Paul. Paul says the perilous times are coming. Jesus talks of these perilous times and we are there. And in these very days, these perilous times, when we are, the church is buffeted from all sides by the wiles of the devil, the white rise to her brother, she says, you need more faith, more boldness and decision in your labors. You need more push and less timidity. Most of us are timid. Let's go distributing the books. Uh, they don't want, they're timid. They're, they, 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 they don't have the confidence to stand in the street and just give out a book, just give out a book. As a matter of fact, you don't have to say a thing. You just have to hold that book like that. Somebody will come and ask for it. Too timid. Oh, can you prepare a sermon for us? Oh, no, I've never done it. I don't think I can do it. Too timid. You see the people next door doing things that are boring, things that are things that an opportunity is presented for you to present Christ. You just smile and go into your corner and start gossiping about it. No action. Take the gospel to them. Two timid brothers and sisters. Two timid. You need more push. And let bring. Let me bring this home. You see these things happening in the church. You see pastors and elders forsaking the faith once delivered to the same. With you, I'm not sure. Just ask questions. What you do? Let you just ask questions. Just ask questions. Right, Pastor? Can you advise me on this? A, B, C happening. Explain this action. Okay, this devil failed me now. But we're too dim. We can't go for the faith. Too dim. Yes, he's among it. Asking God to stop the, the, the plague. He rose out time for prayer. This poor. Take the three in your school. Fear is aggressive. There are times when you must make a charge against the enemy. Love this quotation. It reminds me of. I 
I need a 25 numbers list. Spirit of prophecy says, the Lord, the Bible says, and the Lord, well, for my sake, and then I consumed not the children of Israel in my Jedi. Wherefore, say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. And he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Why? Because he was zealous of his. When you come to the book of Numbers, from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, God had made a promise with the children of Israel. And he said to them, if you hearken my, if you if you hearken to my laws, if you, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and then holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Brothers and sisters, Seventh day Adventists are not ordinary people. We are in this order. One, we have accepted the whole law of God. Paul asked this question in Romans chapter 3. What's the difference between a Jew and a Gentile? What's the difference? What makes these Jews distinct? Much in every way. In that from the beginning, the oracles of God, it's not circumcision that makes them distinct. Their peculiarity is because of the word of God. They were, made depo they were made depositaries of his holy things. Oh, Elder Zimri, don't you know these are perilous times? Friends, are you with me? These are perilous times. COVID comes and the entire conference and the union running around up and down, writing letters to everybody. Lock yourselves in your house. Don't come out. Before the lockdown came, was announced by the government, the church was far in front, pushing for it already. Don't come to our churches. Stay in your homes. Before even Boris Johnson announced the lockdown, the church had already announced one. And now we are asking for a debate on this subject at the general conference. We can't have it. It's not granted. People lost their jobs for refusing to be vaccinated. Let's have a discussion about this. Let's look at the church position about this. It will not be granted. What's happening? Pastor Bellam. Where are the phineases among us? We are living perilous times. There's no other opportunity. Time is going fast, brothers and sisters. We need people to rise up to this high destiny of our calling. Present the truth as it is. 
in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy without fear. You caught spirit of prophecy. And you hear them, oh no, you know, oh no, you know, you, you know, you, you Ellen White says, you know, she didn't want the, the, the material to be used in that way. Preach love, don't preach prophecy. Friends, where are the elders and the leaders prostrating, praying, agonizing between the porch and the altar? For Israel is in trouble. There's a plague among us. Listen to what the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy says, Testament to the Churches, Volume 9, page 19. You know this, but I'll say it again. Over and over again. This is a very important passage of, 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 of uh, 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 writing from the Spirit of Prophecy. In a special sense, Seventh day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning, not the, not the first, but the last. This is it. After this, there's nothing else. Last warning to be proclaimed for a perishing world. On them, the Seventh-day Adventist is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other way so great of importance. They are to allow nothing else absorb their attention. Friends, are you there, brothers and sisters? We need to contain for the faith was delivered to the saints. Tonight, we looked at the example of Elder Phineas. He didn't shrink from duty. We are told by the spirit, the spirit of prophecy, we are told that in these days, strange things will be happening. Not only outside the church, but also inside the church. Strange things will be happening. Friends, we are told to define that the great issue so near at hand, that is the law, weed out to whom God appointed. And you will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter day. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Some will go out from among us who will be the ark. But these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth. Did you hear that? Do not be afraid of them. I tell you, Zimri was a powerful guy in the church. But listen to what the spirit of prophecy says. These cannot make walls to obstruct the truth. For it will go on, go onward and upward to the end. We are told that giants who have occupied our pulpits will fall in these last days. We are told that some ministers will push for Sunday observance within the church. We see it happening already. In America, they're already keeping opening their doors on Sunday. And they're calling it a way of evangelism. They're accepting the rainbow movement in their churches. And here in Europe, you are aware of a division, or sort of, of, the, of, of a division of, of, of a union that is tolerating all that stuff. Look at where we are, brothers and sisters. Will you contend for the faith was delivered to the saints? Will you stand on the past, says the Lord, and say, Father, whatever it takes, here I am, please send me. Well, I want to thank God for this week. We looked at this subject very closely. And I hope and pray that the Holy Ghost is touched to your heart and caused you to think twice 
about your mission and about your calling. Some will fall. Some will be discouraged. Some will be traitors in the walls of in the walls of Zion. But you ought to gather courage and warmth from that. Gather strength. When Zimri opposed the signs, Phineas gathered strength. And when this church has fully reproduced the character of Jesus Christ, called those who are in Babylon out of Babylon to come out and join this church, this faith. When God has finished numbering years, we are told you come and take us to glory. I want to be in that number. I want to be among those who stand on the sea of glass with harps in their hands, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to be among us that group. You need to read the great controversy, what it says about how we'll be sitting around the throne after the 1,000 years. Sin vanquished, the enemy destroyed. We are told those who have been once zealous for the cause of the devil will be the ones sitting closest to the throne. And then after him come those who were martyred for their sake, for, their, for, for his name's sake. And then the great multitude who constitute the outer ring. Who do you want to be that, in that number that will be persecuted for Christ's sake? For contending for the faith means we need to have it in our mind that even if it means dying, I'm prepared to die for, for the cause. Even if it means matter at all, I'm willing to go that far. If that is your prayer, I'm going to ask. Uh, let me see if uh, uh, there are elders here. One of the elders to pray for us. To pray for us. Pray for us. Elder Tena, are you there? If you can come to the mic, if you can hear me. Yes, yes, Elder. I'm here. I want you to pray for, the, for us. The Lord will embolden our hearts, establish us in the truth, never to waver either to the right or to the left, but to be laser focused on our mission. Even if it means being taken to the stake. For some of us will be taken before the kings and governors and courts of this world to testify of our faith. Some of us will be, will be killed as happened in the dark ages. But we must set it in our minds that we are willing to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Thank you, Elder. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Lord and Father, the one who sits high and looks low. This evening, we, your children, come before your presence, asking for forgiveness. Lord, we have procrastinated. We, have, we are reluctant to sound the trumpet and to give it a certain sound. All that we have read in the prophecy, we are seeing coming to pass. And so the time has come, Lord, when we must gird ourselves, when we should cast off our fear and to move forward into battle. Lord, the, the enemy is bold. His agents are not afraid to declare their sinful lifestyles, but your people are quiet. Help us, Lord, not just to have courage when we are in each other's company, but help us, Lord, to go forth and to sound the trumpet, to declare your righteousness and to call sin by its name. You have said in your word that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And you have sent us forth, Father God. And you said that you will be with us even unto the end of the world. 
And so the time of, has come now, Father. For us to stand like the brave. We believe that the curtains are coming down upon this world. We're living at the very end of time. And so there are individuals out there waiting to hear the gospel, the true gospel that was preached by Jesus Christ. The message has been watered down, Father God. We are trying to commingle the gospel with the philosophies of men. But now is the time, Lord, for us to allow the light to shine. In Revelation chapter 18, it is said that the angel will enlighten the whole world. Mm -hmm. The trumpet will be sounded, come out of her, my people. Amen. Help us, Lord, not to be afraid to identify Babylon. Help us not to be afraid, Lord, to identify the man of sin. The one who seeks to take the place of Christ. And help us, Lord, to call Protestants and Catholics to leave Babylon and to join the commandment-keeping church. Father God, we know that there are ministers in our church that are agents of the devil. Some of them are planted here, Lord. We are not naive. We know that there are Jesuits in your church. And so, Father God, we pray that as we go about declaring this truth, we pray, Father God, that the, those who are called by your name will know those whom you have chosen to, to, to represent you and to sound the true gospel. Father God, we thank you for the message that we have heard tonight. We have been awakened. We have been revived by the man of God whom you have sent to declare to us the truth. And so, Lord, we pray that we will not mingle the truth with Hera, but that we will sound it, and we will sound it in the spirit of love. Help us, Lord, not to get cold feet, but help us, Lord, to draw warmth from, those, from, from the coldness of those who have backslidden. Help us, Lord, to draw courage from those who are cowards. And help us, Lord Jesus, to stand in our lot, knowing that, Lord, our names are in the book of life. And if we are faithful, then our names shall remain. And so we thank you, Lord, for the message that we have heard. Thank you for your spirit. Fill us up now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you Amen. so much. And happy Sabbath to every one of you when it comes. And may God bless you. Let's meet again when another opportunity presents itself. God bless you. Amen. Amen, Amen. Elder. God bless you too. God bless. Amen. Amen. We'd like to thank Elder Zelm. Not working. We'd like to thank Elder Zelm for the uh, message. It's certainly we've certainly been blessed this week. Um, there's so much to think about, and especially with the, the church is in trouble. We can see things happening which should never be, and um, we've even ourselves we're about to uh, write to the conference over certain things that's happened that's not been right, and. Um, well, the answer we got back was that they, they can't do anything about it. Very, very sad. We'd like to thank everyone that's joined, and we're going to hand over now to um, Elder Desire to give thanks on behalf of the ministry. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you, sisters, uh, for managing the platform, and um, uh, Sister Arlene as well, who was on during the week. We we're truly blessed by your ministry. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Elder. So we were truly blessed by these messages. Um, you have uh, been used by God to encourage us, uh, to challenge us. Uh, we are truly living in perilous times. 
and it is my prayer that uh, the messages that we have heard, they will, uh, these messages we will surely uh, cherish them and keep them in our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to continue to stay our hearts to do the duty that lies before us. Elder, may God bless you and may God continue to bless your ministry um, as he waters us, may he water, water you abundantly, more abundantly. Um, we're looking forward to the next series. I, I, I'm aware that uh, you are going to be working on another series, Elder, after this one. And uh, whenever you are ready, we will be also ready to hear what says the Lord. Uh, Amen. And thank you, Brethren, for, for joining us well uh, regularly. Um, I wish that we could uh, share these audios. Uh, some of, um, I know the sisters, uh, I've started uploading materials on our YouTube platform. So um, if you want to listen back, um, please get in touch with sisters. They'll share links where you can uh, continue to listen to some of the messages that uh, Elder has been sharing this week. God bless you, brethren. Have a wonderful Sabbath when it comes. And Elder, may God continue to, to bless your ministry. And uh, Mother there, I know she has been uh, ministering in the background. May God bless you. Amen and amen.